not one of these guys. Um, I'm Swati Singh, former ITAM postdoc, currently um, assistant professor at the University of Delaware, and I'm your session chair. Our first speaker is Sugato Bose, who will be talking about sensing quantum gravity and gravitational waves with mesoscopic superposition. So let's get okay. started. Okay. Thank you. So let me start by warmly thanking uh, Marcus and Hussain for this uh, very nice uh, invitation and uh, thanks for making it <laughs> so early in the morning. Okay, uh, For me it's not a problem because I, I was awake quite uh, very early. <coughs> yeah. uh, okay, so <coughs> I'm going to speak, uh, so the title may sh sound very ambitious uh, and, and my, my target is to show that uh, it is actually not that ambitious, uh, uh, from, but again, you will you will find that in the end, probably, I mean, since it's largely experimental audience, um, you will still find it very ambitious. Um, okay, so I start by motivating a bit. So, so superposition principle is in, underpins quantum mechanics. Right? I think uh, no one will uh, deny that. This is uh, you know all if you if you decohere superpositions, you you kill all interesting quantum aspects. <clears throat> and how do we verify superposition? So this is the the, the most uh, one of the most uh, important uh, things is that you should be able to give a controlled relative phase between components of a superposition. That is the that is the real uh, you know proof of a superposition. You should be able to control a phase and and then then see the the variation of the output uh, due to this relative phase between components of a superposition. Yeah. This is how we verify superpositions. What and, and these kinds of superpositions are seen for for a long time in variety of systems now. Uh, what is less less common? Okay, so this is where we'll go to. What is less common are are these kinds of these classes of superpositions where you have many several particles in one state or another. Okay, having said that, the ones which I managed to draw given the the small space are are things where you actually. Are, are, are states which people have generated successfully and verified. For example, people have generated states like many many ions in one state or many ions in another state, up to tens or twenties of ions. Okay. Similarly, people have done interferometry with, with uh, spatially being here and there for for large macromolecules up to ten to the power four atomic mass units. So a lot has been done already, but the the main uh, issue is that, of course, this n is not significantly higher. Okay, um, so the question I'm going to look at, okay, is whether you can go to things like 10 to the power 10 to 10 to the power 13 atoms, yeah, uh, in a, in a system all going one way or other. Okay, this is the the type of thing which we want to create. Yeah, type of thing we want to propose how to how to create. Okay. And then, if so, if you can do that, if you can hold them coherently for, for, for some time to, to the extent that you can actually give relative phases to verify such superpositions, what you can do with it. Okay. Okay. So two of those applications that I will, I will mention today are the ones in the title slide. So one would be to test the quantum nature of, fundamentally quantum nature of gravity, and the other is this uh, detection of gravitational wave with a you know, reasonably compact apparatus. <clears throat> now, uh, there are varieties of schemes and the trick, the general trick to use here, okay, which, which makes, so noon states are, are very uh, difficult if you think from the fundamental bu building blocks. Like if you think of several atoms, then it takes an effort, several control not gates uh, to, to generate noon states. But uh, easier, you know, way is to take an entire crystal, okay, and kind of make them go one way or other. Okay, so then all the atoms in the crystal, of course, they are all tied together by by you know the the, the crystal uh, crystal forces, and they all go one way or other. Okay, and there are, are are several schemes for that. Okay, so there are these things where you try to beam split uh, using you know optical wavelengths. Okay. So this was pioneered by Marcus Arn, but also done by Henrik Ulbrich uh, these days. Okay, and then there are also <coughs> things proposed from Marcus's group. Okay, again, initially you cool a trapped particle, but then you let it interact with quantized light and subsequently measure it, and then you can prepare superpositions. Okay, so these are some ways to make an entire crystal be here and there at the same time. Okay, so so my 
my uh, ambition is to look at applications of those things. But I would also, I also have a favorite kind of scheme, okay, to generate these things. And this favorite kind of scheme actually originates actually from, from Schrodinger's idea of how to create a superposition, namely it is ancilla induced, okay. So, so this is the oldest technique of creating superpositions. You have something which you believe can be created in a, in a superposition, so which is, has been, uh, you know, people have checked uh, in, in bona fide experiments that you can create a superposition. So there is an atom, uh, radioactive atom which is decays or not decays or not decays and then there is a coupling with that and, and, uh, and a macroscopic object. So the coupling is the gun here and, and then you have this cat here, right, okay. So this is a kind of, uh, you take a bona fide quantum system and try to couple it to a larger system to, you know, to create the superposition. However, once you have created a superposition of a macroscopic system, it is not easy to verify it, right. So, so this is why what my general approach has been for, for a long time now, as I will show you, is, is both ancilla induced and ancilla probed superpositions, okay. So this is, so of course, so initially the cat is alive cor com corresponding to both components of the atom state. And then, of course, you create this superposition. Then you apply a relative phase, yeah, to the to the, the different components of the cat. Okay. So as I as I said, you know, to apply a relative phase is very important to verify the superposition. And then you do another interaction. So this, of course, doesn't have in Schrod happen in Schrodinger's case because the irreversibility. But if you have a nice, say, single mode, say a mechanical mode, you, it can happen again. Okay. But, and, and it reverses back and this phase information is mapped on purely to the ancilla, okay. So I should confess to you due to shortage of space, I mean this is actually five steps. So I have incorporated two steps here, here yeah. So the, the cat becoming alive again, uh, resurrecting, the resurrection of the cat as well as the phase, you know, uh, going back there, okay. So there are, there are actually two steps here, yeah. And then you can just probe the ancillary system to verify the superposition. As long as you are very sure that this phase which was applied can only be, is very dependent on specifically on this alive and dead states of the cat, okay. So it cannot be applied to the ancilla alone, okay. So then this phase, the qualitative nature of the phase can verify that this cat was in a superposition at intermediate times, okay. So you do and undo, okay, and uh, come back with the phase, okay. So I have been involved in this kind of idea for a very long time, so this is my undergraduate work, okay. So there you, you have these neutrons hitting a four mirror system. The first kick starts moving the mirrors up, then the second kick, uh, then the, this uh, other kick stops it, then this another kick starts moving back and this kick stops it. So you do and undo and any decoherence which would have happened to, to this mirror system would be mapped purely to the neutron ancilla, okay. Now, uh, when I came to Imperial College to do my, my PhD and I gave that talk, this is one of the previous slide and then I had my uh, friend uh, Kurt Jacobs, he was also doing PhD at the same time. He said, I know a system where you can do, it. this happens naturally, okay. So we wrote a paper. So what happens here, you do not need to have these two interactions either. If you have an optomechanical system where you have a light interacting with the cavity mode, okay, then depending on the different Fox states of the, the light, the, 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 the mirror oscillates about different centers, okay. And when you have that situation, then of course in intermediate time, say pi, half the time, some, uh, you know, some uh, superposition will be generated and then they will come back. Of course, uh, what was the problem there is to give this relative phase. Okay. This relative phase was not easy to give at that time. Now, at least didn't we find, uh, didn't find a way and we suggest various things, okay, decoherence or partial coherence, which the decoherence being a random phase unique to that, okay. Then some other papers which kind of use, use the same maths they, they, from, from our paper, but also they suggest the decoherence and recoherence, okay. But anyway, the, the problem of this relative phase we didn't sort out at that time, but but more recently we realized that is also very easy, okay. So there is a slide which has gone somehow, okay. Anyway, so uh, that may suddenly appear elsewhere. But what you do is you slant, you can just incline the, the, the system slightly, okay, tilt the system slightly and then these 
mirror states will be in different gravitational potentials and then you can uh, or, or different uh, arcs gravitational potentials and you can you can impart a relative phase okay? now comes to my uh, recently favorite uh, kind of system since you know since kind of uh, 2013 is the fact that this ancillary system which was neutrons before or optics uh, later can actually be a spin okay the uh, a spin is a, is a generally a highly coherent you know uh, type of uh, qubit okay and you uh, think of levitating uh, 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 an object okay um, where you have uh, you know um, a single spin embedded inside okay so this is a NV center uh, spin a single NV center think of it for the moment okay I know this is a very poor approximation to say uh, think of it for the moment as a giant atom okay so you have a single spin degree of freedom inside and a giant mass around it so it's a crystal with a single impurity uh, embedded inside which has spin states the typical thing that we used uh, is uh, NV centers uh, in, in diamonds in that example, but need not be, okay. It need not be an NV center, it can be any, any kind of uh, spin system, okay. <coughs> uh, you need to be able to read the spin state out. So we consider an initial state, an arbitrary initial state, uh, a random coherent state beta of this object and the initial state of the spin say in a zero. So NV center is a three level system. And then there's a magnet nearby which provides an inhomogeneous field, okay. So this magnet is there to provide a stern garlock coupling, okay. <coughs> it's, simi it's, a, it's similar to a mechanism proposed before uh, here by Peter Rubble and others, okay. Now what you do is a time t equal to zero, you prepare, uh, so, ah, so this is a typo here, sorry, so I, I forget to, to uh, correct this type in all my so you at time t equal to zero create an equal superposition of plus one and minus one okay so you come with the microwave pulse okay and from the zero you create plus one and minus one okay superposition and this is still there okay and, and this magnetic field inhomogeneous magnetic field is coupling is just a stern garlock effect so what it will do is it will split the wells okay so for plus one the particle oscillates in one well for minus one the particle oscillates in another well okay so it splits the wells okay and then this is kind of dynamics, okay, so different coherent states and there are, are some kinds of phases there, okay. Now what you can do is additionally you can have a tilt of this uh, magnetic field relative to the, the horizontal so that these wells, the, the, the center of oscillation of these wells are at different heights, okay. So this will give a uh, a gravitational potential difference, okay, this is, this is well known kind of gravitational potential difference which people have measured long time ago with neutrons. This is the famous uh, COW experiment, Colella Overhouse or Werner experiment uh, and it's the same, qualitatively the same thing, okay. So these, these wells are at different potentials relative to the earth and they acquire relative phase and then uh, at, uh, you know, so after some time okay so they oscillate and then they come back okay so the coming back hasn't been shown probably. so essentially after one time period they will come back to the original coherent state okay because you know harmonic evolution is cyclic now when it comes back to the original coherent state that happens irrespective of the initial coherent state right so it does not depend on what it was okay so you can have an arbitrary thermal state in principle as long as the harmonic oscillator approximation is valid okay you don't care what thermal state is you can have it start here, have it start here, have it start here with whatever momentum, whatever, it will just come back to its original state and the spin state will, you know, decouple from it. And when this spin state decouples, then you can purely measure the spin, right, and, and measure this relative phase, okay. So you can use this kind of spin measurement as an, as an interferometry, okay. So there are some caveats and uh, things which to which I, I don't go at the moment. But using very reasonable magnetic field gradients, okay, you can create uh, for a 10 to the power 10 AMU mass, okay, so this is a nano crystal like a 10 nanometer crystal, you can create a 1 picometer superposition, okay. So the, the centers of mass are separated by a picometer here, all the all, entire nano crystal here or entire nano crystal picometer. But because the Earth's gravitational, uh, you know, acceleration is pretty, you know, pretty strong, 
the, the it can give a very strong relative phase here, okay, this delta phi, okay, of order of unity, okay, and then you can verify the superposition, yeah. It all requires to tilt your apparatus slightly, okay. Okay, so this is, this is the, the tilting I was telling you before, okay, uh, okay. So now, of course, we would not want to remain restricted to these picometers, and, and on top of that, when you trap some things optically, there are also photon shot noise, okay, which will be a, a mechanism of decoherence. So the idea is to release, okay. So you saw in these two, uh, the, the, one of the early slides I was showing two schemes, one from Marcus's group, one from Henrik Ulbricht's group of releasing things. So actually it is a good idea always to release from traps to get rid of the photon shot noise decoherence. So you can do the same thing as, as the scheme I said before but you can release from the trap, okay. Now the question is does this nice property of decoupling at, so what happened to this nice property which we were using to make it robust to the initial, you know, thermal noise floor, uh, it was immune just because of this harmonic dynamics, no, it, it, it does, didn't matter where it started, it depends on the, on the relative distance, okay. It's just like in atom interferometry, it depends only on the relative distance, doesn't depend on where it starts, okay, as long as the field is uniform over that, that regime, okay. So that's, that's important. The field has to have a uniform gradient and, um, you know, uh, and, and it, the harmonic potential approximation has to, has to be valid. But, but does that work for, you know, uh, work for a free particle and, and indeed it does. Now, of course, you have to design a scheme to make it work, okay. So, you have to flip spins at appropriate time, okay. This is called stern garlock experiment, okay. So, it has also been actually done with atoms already by, by the group of Ron Fallman. Uh, what, what you really need to do is you start with the super, start with up plus down, then you release and, of course, in the stern garlock field, the things accelerate oppositely. At appropriate times, you do the spin flips, then it, you know, slows down, turns back, and then you spin flip again and it, you know, accelerates or decelerates and come to the same motional state, okay. So this is actually exactly the same pulse as someone yesterday was uh, showing these uh, uh, spin echo pulses. Um, who was speaking about spin echo yesterday, spin echo pulses? I forgot now. Uh, ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's exactly those, those pulses, yeah. So you have uh, two pi pulses and, and a pi by two and a pi by two. So uh, now, um, um, right, yeah, yeah, actually he is uh, not here, right? yeah, 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 Anyway, so, so those, the, it's the same thing, but, and actually the motion comes back, and then of course you can give a relative phase as, as before, if you want, by slight uh, tilting, okay. <clears throat> And uh, you can you can you know, verify the the advantage of this method is since these are freely released okay from the harmonic oscillator you can go to superpositions of you know hundreds of nanometers okay for uh, nanocrystals okay uh, now okay so now now since these these are are sufficiently large of getting sufficiently large okay of course still nanocrystals are not su sufficient for what i'm going to say but suppose you go to microcrystals okay so i, I <coughs> learned that people have started trapping you know microspheres and that's how uh, you know uh, i thought this would be possible is that their gravity can also become quite important they are you know the, them as a source of gravity okay <coughs> Now, so whether you can use this indeed to create a gravitationally mediated entanglement, okay, that is the question. So gravitationally mediated entanglement has been mentioned a few times in the literature before. I mean, of course, I cannot be exhaustive here. There are probably more mentions than what I have I've, uh, put up on here. But the earliest attempt, though, of course, entanglement was not a term in vogue these days, and, and I, I, I don't think even, even, he, he even fully himself appreciated the full impact of what he was saying. But essentially, there was this question asked to Feynman in a, in a, in a conference, uh, and these are all colloquial, you know, dialogues noted down, that <coughs> what if gravity is not quantum? And then he says that, uh, you know, uh, you, uh, you can do, then do this experiment where essentially he's also s using a stern garlock like scheme to split spatially one mass, and then the gravitational interaction moves one mass another, one way or another, and then he said that to fully analyze all the, you know, all the outputs you will get from an, such an experiment, you need to calculate, you know, amplitudes using, you know, full uh, quantum mechanical treatment of, of gravity, okay. Uh, 
uh, it, that's was at that. Okay, so then also uh, more recently, you know, uh, Jake who is here and his st uh, student uh, Kafri, they they also were talking about how to falsify classical only theories of of gravity, and uh, there are some ways of from from the the noises induced. You can find how much entanglement uh, uh, you know can be generated between some some weights. Okay, and also Marcus wrote this paper on on close range gravity measurement and in the end he wrote that since you know these are getting towards the small now so perhaps you can gravitationally entangle okay so what struck me as these kind of uh, schemes i was mentioning to you before with this spin okay so if you have a spin up it goes one way spin down it goes another way here i have suppressed that spin index okay in this slide you can actually generate quite a detectable amount of gravitational entanglement within a very reasonable time. Okay. Okay, so what do I mean by gravitational entanglement here is that you have two masses now, two interferometers. Okay, so one interferometer here, you create left plus right, another interferometer next to it, you create left plus right, and you ensure that the right left combination is at least as close as the superposition scale. Okay. So this is a highly you know what we would call in quantum optics a highly non gaussian limit okay where the closest approach of of two masses is much closer than the you know or closer same scale as the superposition size if you do manage to do that okay then this is very much like what we call a c phase gate or a cz gate in in in, in uh, quantum information uh, uh, so the, the the newtonian interaction will create such a kind uh, entangling gate and this is how the dynamics happens so you start with l plus r and l plus r okay of, of of two masses and depending on their mutual gravitational interaction whether they are close or far okay so these are the, of course the, the, the newtonian uh, interaction depends on distance you have different phases accumulated okay now if if the sum of these two phases is pi then you cannot actually uh, you know write this the final state as a product state so they are entangled okay so due to the mutual gravitational interaction they are entangled okay this is the same uh, same way it is because this is like an ising interaction okay so it, it entangles the, the particles okay? <clears throat> and the interesting thing is that if you are working with microspheres then the the conditions needed to achieve them doesn't seem to be tantalizingly hard okay so doesn't uh, you know, this is not astrophysically hard or something like that. Okay, it's still very challenging. Okay, you you need microspheres, 10 to the power minus 14 kg, and their closest approach, of course, is blocked to be have to be more than 200 microns. Okay, you cannot bring them closer to 200 microns. Okay, because otherwise the Casimir uh, interaction gets uh, strong. Okay. So, so that means, of course, also these uh, spatial superpositions that you make have to be about 100 microns, okay? because as I said, the spatial separation has to be comparable to this uh, distance to have this fast, you know, significant amount of entanglement. Okay? Then if you can hold this superposition for one second, then what happens is that you get this phase of unity. This may come as a surprise to people who think gravitational interaction is, is very weak. Of course, capital G is very weak. I mean, here, this is just you have to put the numbers here. Yeah? So this is 10 to the power, if you put 10 to the power minus 10 uh, in place of capital G. The, the thing is that there's a, in this phase development, a phase is, of course, E by H cross. Okay, frequency is E by H cross. So the 10 to the power minus 34, really, Planck's constant fights the gravitational constant and makes this phase a uh, unity. Okay, if you have microspheres, okay, and uh, the the challenge, of course, is to have no other interaction, right, than gravity. If you if you have to make sure that the entanglement was caused solely due to gravity, okay, that is our aim. We want to have this uh, entanglement caused solely due to gravity. Then you also have to ensure other things. One of the main important things is that Casimir interaction. Okay, of course, they have to be neutral. And there are other requirements, maybe I'll, I'll discuss a bit later. Um, but essentially, what happens also that if you are used, so of course, the question is how do you verify this entanglement, right? You have to verify this entanglement. And this is where the, the, the spin technique that I was, the Sterngarlach technique that I was referring to becomes, comes in very handy, 
Okay? Because earlier, you remember the spin came back with the relative phase. Now what happens to the two spins in the two apparatus? You just need to redo the previous math with the extra spin label and you will see the masses are at the end of interferometry coming back. Okay? So they are not entangled anymore. Okay? But the spins in them okay, have ended up getting this gravitational entanglement. So the entanglement has been induced by the Newtonian interaction of the two masses, but it has accumulated on the, the yeah, on the, sorry. So the, um, so the, the, the and, and then spin entanglement is very easy to verify, okay. A lot of people have verified spin entanglement, okay. Uh, you know, you just measure spins in a couple of bases, okay. Uh, right. So now uh, I probably need to, dis so spin correlations, five minutes, okay. So spin correlation functions can certify this entanglement, okay. So we have entanglement which is gravitationally mediated and you can verify using spins. So the question is now, of course, what does it imply, okay. Does it imply anything interesting, okay. So, so there is this thing, uh, this uh, principle in quantum information that local operations and classical communication cannot entangle. So if you have two apparatus, okay, uh, two, two systems, okay, and you are entirely allowing only local unitary operations on them and endless classical, you know, information transfer, you cannot entangle them, okay. So if you find a gravitationally mediated entanglement, then if there was a mediator, that must be quantum, okay. So this is how you can claim from this, uh, this evidencing this entanglement that you have evidenced uh, a quantum aspect of gravity because classical, classically a uh, field cannot entangle, okay. Of course, this local operations and classical communication might seem a bit cryptic to, you know, to people, um, uh, physicists more accustomed to think in terms of fields, but the net idea is that if you have a classical field acting on a system, okay, okay, if it's a quantum system, you just have a local unitary operation, you have a unitary operation, okay. If you go slightly more general that your classical field can be random, have two or three values but with different probabilities, still it's a random unitary with some probabilities. And those things on either side will never entangle systems, okay. So if you start from no entanglement to go to entanglement, no classical uh, description of the, the gravitational field suffices, okay. This is the, this is the problem, okay. This is of course accepting a mediator. So in, in the, in the appendix of our paper, we had this kind of, uh, you know, calculation assuming a harmonic oscillator mediator. There are also other works, okay. So for example, uh, Rovelli has shown that this, you know, uh, demonstrates superposition of space times. Also there's group from, work from Marcus's group, which on, on, uh, not on lead, but on solving some paradoxes, which uh, kind of tells that it's necessary to emit gravitons at some stage when you create such, you know, superpositions. Uh, so, so, uh, so I'm not going into those kinds of details, but I just want to mention this fact that, you know, there is a, how, how do f uh, interactions ap uh, appear in nature? They appear in nature due to exchange of virtual particles, okay. So, so there is a quantum description for the Newtonian interaction to arise through the exchange of a virtual graviton, okay. Yet there are also classical descriptions, okay. So for example, uh, Taylor and Milburn and Caffrey have a classical description. There are many other classical ways of, you know, uh, you can generate gravitational field. So how do you know which is correct? Is that some classical description correct or, or is this uh, virtual particle exchange correct, okay. So evidencing this entanglement will show that a quantum, you know, description is the, is the correct one, okay. <clears throat> now I, I have very less time, I guess, so I'll just briefly mention the other uh, uh, application of these, uh, these uh, superpositions of masses. Now we scale down a little bit the mass, so we require only nanosphere superpositions, so 10 to the power minus 17 kg masses, but we require a, a meter uh, scale superposition, okay. Uh, then you can actually sense that that apparatus can sense actually gravitational fields of 10 to the power, you know, 10 to the power minus 19, uh, you know, amplitude, okay, uh, gravitational waves, okay. So this is the, the total phase acquired by two components of superposition. So one of the components now has to not split, okay. This is because of the nature of the gravitational wave, okay. So it essentially 
think of this thing as like hxx into vx square. So we just give a vx, okay. Uh, so it competes with the kinetic energy, okay. So it's a uh, uh, it's hxx vx square, and and uh, as you see, of course, it's a it's a weaker effect compared to you know. The Newtonian effect is with C square, the frame dragging is with 1 C replaced by V and the gravitational waves is, is with the velocities of the object, uh, you know, replaced. But with the accelerations we can give in this, uh, you know, this turn garlic interferometry, you can have something like 10 meters per second. Then you can actually, there's just also this H cross below to get the phase. You can have a unit uh, phase shift, okay, by, uh, you know, for, for uh, 10 to the power minus 19 amplitude waves, okay. Uh, I, will, I will skip over this, but just one important thing to say is that uh, the, the gravitational wave, uh, of course, separating it from these other effects is challenging, of course, right. So, these, it's, it's, it's subject to all these effects. So, you have to identify this particular signal. This is an important challenge. But on the way to building it, suppose you are, you are building um, larger and larger superpositions gradually, it always has an, this, this also has a good side that it has an application. So it can, uh, you know, uh, detect accelerations of, of very low, you know, 10 to the power minus 16 meter per second square per, per root hertz, I, I, ideally, you know, if you, if you have, have a flux of like 200 of these uh, objects. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, no, no, this is not the gravitational wave. Okay, so uh, yeah, yeah, so it's on the stronger side, in about minus 19. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's what we can detect with this. Um, so uh, this this is the, the the kind of acceleration that it can sense. Yeah, but <clears throat> so yeah, so this is coming here. Okay, so the the. The, the 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 thing is, of course, our interferometer works that you have to split and you have to bring it back, right? So this requires time, okay? Otherwise, it will require enormous magnetic field gradients, okay? So for magnetic field gradients, which are extremely ambitious, we use ten to power six tesla per meter, which is extremely ambitious, okay? So and uh, a second with which you go back, then you can create this meter, okay? But you cannot do it any faster, right? So if you have very fast gravitational waves, they will cancel out the signal. Yeah? So we cannot do anything about it. We have we have to work faster than that, okay? And uh, so so, but but slow frequency there is essentially no limit. There is something due to the the gravity gradient noise if you do terrestrial implementation, but for space-based implementations principle, there's, there's no lower limit, okay? But it works below LIGO. Right? It 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 starts working exactly at the atomic interferometry regime because it's, it's, it's the very similar principles. It's a giant atom, okay. The de Broglie wavelength is much smaller, okay. And then it, uh, it well, there's no fundamental limit on that side, okay. <clears throat> yeah, so maybe I take questions. So, yeah, these are the, 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 the some of the papers which uh, we have written on this and some related works by other people. Right, right, right. I don't think I'm, I'm getting it. So the, right. the, the question he asked was um, basically what does um, gravitation induced entanglement mean? Mean, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then you said, well, uh, we know from quantum information that no local combination of local operation and classical communication, so LOCC, can generate uh, entanglement. It cannot. Exactly. So yeah, no, yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, then somehow you map the situation onto an LOCC. So the, basically the cow phase, yeah. in a way you say, is an is a, is a LOCC operation. Yeah. yeah because uh, yeah. somehow the gravitational potential is generated by the source mass, which is somewhere away, but it's a local potential, yeah. uh, the local phase shifts that you, yeah. that you generate. This yeah. is the argument. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, okay, yeah, yeah. So, so let me uh, qualify a little bit. So, I, I did not go, so uh, we have actually clarified this uh, somewhat better in a, in a later year, but uh, I, I did not in this talk uh, say uh, what my definition of classicality is, yes. right? Of course, so that, that is very important to say uh, outright, what is classicality, if you are to say non-classical. So classicality definition I will take is that you have 
field uh, values which can be you know either stochastic or single valued at, at a place okay but not uh, allowed to be in a superposition itself or even the joint superposition so if you go to church of higher hilbert space you cannot even write it as a superposition in any any hilbert phase so fundamentally you have either uh, you know values of uh, say h h mu nu with h mu nu 1 h mu nu 2 h mu nu 3 with various probabilities p1 p2 p3 okay or you have just a h mu nu okay so these are uh, yeah so 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 you this is the most general definition of classicality i'm taking so under this definition of classicality what will happen to one of the masses subjected to this okay is either a unitary operation because only only the quantum variables of that matter is included or a probability probabilistically different unitary operations right and that 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 is the local unitary okay, uh, okay. Uh, yeah but then, yeah. then i guess then the additional question is um, would do you really then need the mediator because in the picture you just gave i could um, imagine that uh, i just have a right. local potential yeah um, that correlates to the position of the source um, but then it's sufficient um, to basically uh, have a superposition of the position of my source in order to generate a superposition of the uh, the local potential lens. Right, right, right. Um, and this is not in contrast to what you just said, because I just don't assume mm -hmm. a mediator, I just assume right, right. that I have potential values right. um, uh, that depend right. on the position of on the, on the position of the canonical variable. Right, right. Okay. No, no. So it's another good question. So actually, in fact, there are three assumptions in our thing. Okay. So I, I should. I, I was thinking of copying and pasting that slide. So it's not in our original paper, but it's something we have written in response to many of these similar questions. So first one I have already told you. Uh, yeah, so the first one is that uh, you uh, this uh, yeah the, the local um, operator. I said the definition of classicality. Definition of classicality. But there is also the locality is very important. So locality of physical interactions is, is prime uh, assumption in our, our thing. So, so Newtonian interaction cannot be action at a distance. Okay? To ensure micro causality, uh, you have a, a propagator, a causal propagator. So essentially what we say is that you have, uh, you know, physical interactions are local. So a mass here will generate curvature only locally and then that has, you know, the, the, it is the, that the curvature which has the effect on the other mass. This mass is not, you know, directly uh, interacting with the other mass. Okay, so this is an assumption. So I used to say the mediator is an assumption. I, I recast these as uh, you uh, locality as an assumption. So locality means that you have to have a mediator because the masses are not in the same place. Okay, and there is a third assumption which is. Uh, uh, Maybe it is do available. I have not. We have not thought greatly. Is that the weak? You know, the weak field limit. So uh, we are. We are uh, because if you have very strange space times and stuff, maybe the, the there there are you know you, you can generate uh, entanglement somehow uh, because you can have time like loops whatsoever. So we we just uh, uh, so so weak weak gravity is another uh, third assumption. Uh, we have not. I have I've forgotten to. So this is this is on the archive. Yeah, it's uh, the same guy. Is the first author, Marshman. Okay. Uh, <coughs> when you specify microdynamics, um, non-conductive, um, I think most experimentalists were worried. Uh, you know, because it's uh, the um, going to get charge uh, smeared randomly all over these things. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it's a very good, again, a very good question. Okay, and, and uh, you know, people, of course, have asked this to me before. So, of course, the main, main, uh, the the primary interaction can be cancelled thanks thanks to some of the techniques which you know Dave Moore and uh, have discovered and also uh, yeah Grapp uh, yesterday mentioned. So the primary, the, the the charge you can get rid of by shining ultraviolet either to the, but. Of course, this doesn't get rid of these multiple moments inside. Okay, so the dipole moment, the if you if you calculate, so I, for example, I got the estimate from Dave yesterday. 
then it is 10 to the power 6 orders, if, if there is a dipole moment inside, then for these things 10 to the power 6 order times larger than the gravitational interaction for these um, 100 micron distances. So, so we have to use this technique which uh, uh, Professor Gap Grappa was mentioning uh, yesterday, so you spin, okay. So you spin with, spin initial and then you drop, okay. So the, the, if the spin rotation is much faster than the, you know, so this is physically spin, this is not the other spin. So then this uh, will average out, okay, and, 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 and this spin is a commuting degree of freedom, hopefully, and we have access in those, so, so I'm skipping some things over, but one has to do a careful calculation then you can get rid of this, uh, you know, thing. And one does not have to use diamonds and envy. Diamond has another bad thing is the diamagnetism. So probably one uses silico, uh, so there are other kinds of things in quantum information, car, car, uh, silicon carbide. So you, you have to get a nice clean qubit inside a single crystal without many defects. Yeah. Um, and and I, I think a lot of these clock things which we have discussed yesterday are exceptional qubits. You have to put one inside <laughs> one of those crystals to combine these two methodologies. Um, yeah, so so I think it's, it's not yet fully worked out how to get rid of all the, you know, um, multiple moments. All right, any yeah. other questions? Okay. All right, then, uh... <clears throat>